All right, welcome everybody. This is Shalina from risingwoman.com and today I have Susan Anderson who is the author of The Journey from Abandonment to Healing. Welcome Susan, thanks for being here. Nice to be here. So Susan, your work has been really influential in the Rising Woman community. It's a book that I used when I was going through a really tumultuous time in my life in my mid-20s. And it's been a book that we have passed on to all of our readers since. So we have probably hundreds of people who have purchased your book um, because of our word about it. And it's just been one of those things that's really catalyzed a lot of healing and growth. So I wanted you to share a little bit about your work today on abandonment recovery and kind of what got you into that. And, uh, and then we'll kind of take it from there. Well, um, abandonment recovery is, you know, it's good news because people going through what you described as a tumultuous experience, which really is almost an understatement for the kind of pain that it creates when a relationship ends or you've been fired or, you know, you ha you feel rejected or you, you feel abandoned. Um, it's a tumultuous experience, but the good news is that because it stirs up so many emotions, it becomes really a, an open an open heart surgery. You can really create um, a clean system in there. You can really, you know, do do some reconstructive work that's very important. So it is taking a, one of life's most painful experiences, and uh, the literature doesn't really speak to the pain of this experience, at least. All the perusing that I have done has never been to my satisfaction describing the intensity of the pain mm -hmm. that this can cause people, the frustration and the terrible hopelessness and despair. Um, but it takes that adversity and it makes sure that instead of being diminished by feeling rejected and going through an abandonment, you are, you know, you are enhanced, you, you become stronger and better. Um, so the um, way I got into it is that I lost in the love of my life, my marital partner of 18 years, we were madly in love, we had a beautiful life, we, we were raising children and we, we just had the most wonderful, beautiful relationship and he all of a sudden left me for another woman. Mm -hmm. And I was devastated, but what's ironic, is that I, at the time, I, I was a therapist like I am now, and I was already kind of specializing in abandonment, helping people with this kind of thing, and people were so grateful for all of my help. But what I discovered is when I was going through it, is that my tools that I thought were so wonderful and I would people thank me for were very weak compared to how painful it was. Mm -hmm. So it set me on a journey of research and exploration, searching for better tools, ways that could actually work with that primal fear that gets awakened and the shame that gets awakened. Because those two feelings, shame and primal fear, are they're, they're very intertwined. Mm -hmm. And um, those feelings are so powerful that we tend to be afraid of them and not go near them and they, they remain rather hidden. In fact, they're considered dissociated feelings. Yeah. But I was looking for ways of getting in there and actually working with those feelings. And that is how um, my, you know, my, my work was born, really, d developing a program that would be effective. So I've written four books on the subject, and uh, I don't know how many, you know, articles and blogs and, and interviews and things of this sort, to tr and workshops, etc., to try to spread the word. That's wonderful. Thank you for doing that, because your book was a real lifesaver for me, I, and I mean it, lifesaver, because you know, for, for me, I grew up with a lot of childhood trauma and developmental trauma and that kind of all got stuffed. And so it wasn't actually until I went through a really painful abandonment and divorce in my mid twenties, where all of the stuff that I had sort of suppressed came out in the open and that yeah. was triggered for the first time. And I can remember feeling so much pain that I literally thought I might die in my sleep. And I would 
run up and down my stairs just to sort of move the energy. And when I would feel like I was going crazy, I'd pick up your book and I would just read until I calmed down. And it would really bring me present to what was going on in my body, what was being triggered, and also remembering that, you know, this is actually a normal physiological function that's happening because of what's occurring um, and helping me sort of calm that in a, in a healthy way rather than resorting to a coping mechanism. Um, well, I mean, we, we use those too because it's such a painful experience that we do, um, we do anything that we can to get through the night. If it means running up and down the stairs, we do it. Um, we'll, we'll do whatever we have to do. All kinds of bad habits get formed while people are going through this. Even, if the, even people who are working with the program of abandonment recovery can pick up um, alcoholism because that you alcohol kind of and that it's addictive so you each time you use it sort of as a way of passing out your body gets more addicted to it or they pick up a pattern of being attracted to the unavailable so that they can use the itch to to, to you know pursue someone and catch them and make them love you they can use that as a distraction from the abandonment wound that's been wake, awakened um, you know, what, what you describe, everything that had been shut down from childhood on, because we do, with children, shut it down. They get distracted, they shut it down. But it is a cumulative wound, this human universal abandonment wound. It doesn't, it's not about the one heartbreak that we have in adult life or when we were a teenager or something, you know, and maybe people might realize, well, it reopened my old high school a heartbreak. No, it does more than that. It actually goes back all the way to infancy, practically. And and all it, it is a cumulative wound. It contains every discombobulation moment of self doubt, shame, which we we our entire childhoods and and adolescence are infused with moments of shame. But it contains all of that, so that when it's cracked open, it can be overwhelming. And because it's so overwhelming, it can make people feel weak. Then they feel ashamed for feeling so weak. It can make them feel they're going crazy. It can make them feel that they that they're that they're they deserve being abandoned because look, I'm such a basket case. I I can't handle anything. You see, this proves it. I can't I can't conduct myself properly. But it this is this kind of very intense reaction is absolutely normal and it's part of being human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important for people to hear that, especially from someone like you who's worked with this so much to remember that, you know, when we feel crazy or out of control, like it's a bit of a normal response in, in, in what's happening um, and you're not actually crazy, but you're, there's a need there that really needs to be attended to. It is. You've just, you've really, you're, you're having open heart surgery. I mean, you've just been split wide open. You've just been severed from your Siamese twin. It is a crisis. Um, and it, what happens is that when you feel abandoned, which means there's some rejection feeling involved in there, it scares us to the core that we're not worthy, that we're not attachment worthy, that we're rejectable, which means when we were infants, if we couldn't make our, our caretaker stay attached to us and we were abandoned, we died. Yeah. So the stakes are life and death. So that, that feeling of panic and feeling overwhelmed is because it's perfectly natural for the nervous system to have a life and death, you know, the, the, um, the, the survival, the fight, flee, and freeze. It's, it's normal to have panic and those, those survival uh, reactions to come up because it really, in, internally and consciously, it, it feels as if our life is threatened. Mm -hmm. It isn't. We live to love again. We, we get strong from it. Um, but at the time, that's how it feels. So let's talk about that a little bit because I think that a lot of people who are dealing with an abandonment wound may not actually know that that's what's happening for them. They might just think that they're going crazy. Um, and the other thing that often comes up is not really recognizing 
the way an abandonment wound can form because there's just so many little nuanced experiences that can happen, especially when we're young, that we may not count as something that could have, you know, incurred an invisible injury. But I think that it's a little bit more complex than what you would expect of just like abandonment looks one way where, you know, somebody just disappears from your life, but it's more complex than that. Yeah. I mean, you could have a kind of, a lot of times abandonment in childhood is kind of a chronic situation. Let's say that uh, this is a common one. Uh, one of your parents is alcoholic. They, they're still in the house, but they're, they're there physically and they talk and they act like maybe a parent, but they're really not fully there because their their primary relationship is with the alcohol. So that it's sort of an, a subtle kind of abandonment where it's the case of the disappearing parent who is there but not completely there. So you could have like a chronic situation. One of your parents could be ill, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but there are so many other things that accrue to that, to the to the kind of being a child who has a sibling who seems to get more attention, um, moving a lot where you're, you're um, always the new kid on the block and having to readjust to a new environment, all these things, many things. I mean, it's just the list of things that can accrue are tremendous. But then when you get to the social stage where you know more or less how you're doing socially, do people um, laugh at your jokes? Do they want to be your friend? Are you able to command friendships? Can you hold on to them and so forth? And the, to the great extent, you, the answer may be yes, but every time it doesn't work out and you feel dissed and you're a kid, you know, you kind of notice that and it and you look at other kids who don't seem to be having that struggle and then you compare yourself and wish you had a different, you were more compelling and feel inadequate. These things are so subtle, but they can be very chronic because they're episodic and they happen, you know, over the course of a week, it could happen three or four times that, you know, that you were ignored or, or something of that sort. So you go through the family part, then you have the social part. And then as you get into puberty, you have the romantic part where you may have a crush on someone, but you don't even expect them to feel the same way about you because you're in such a one down position or it's a fickle person who first shows an interest and then changes it the number of things can be so small and so much normal part of everyday life, but they can be so powerful. I like that you differentiated it between those three parts as well, because I think a lot of times someone will say, well, I'm, I can't have an abandonment wound because, you know, my parents didn't abandon me or both my parents were in the home and, and loved me. And I think, you know, the way you say it, there's all these other things going on, you know, with that school and um, in our early puberty stages as well. And also, sometimes we can discount the experience as a child where we can't really differentiate between what's our fault and what's not. So even our parents, you know, going away for surgery or, um, you know, they're having a hard time in their marriage. And so they're a little bit emotionally distant for a year. Or All they're going through a grief. One of your grandparents died and they're a little bit remote. And so you feel there's a shame that what's wrong with me? How come I'm not able to make mommy happy again? And, you know, if I were more special, mommy wouldn't be crying or you know there's just so much, much sort of subliminal stuff you're not even aware that you're thinking or feeling that's going on even in the best of families in the happiest family mm -hmm. yeah that's important to note because a lot of people struggle when they're experiencing their abandonment wound in you know their adult relationships and like why do i have this i don't understand and it's not possible and sort of the more that i dive into this work and attachment work and uh i i kind of see that almost all of us were carrying some form of childhood wounding um, and it doesn't always have to be this catastrophic trauma but the you know it's very interesting that you're that you're bringing that issue up of some people actually don't don't recognize that they can have this reaction even if they had the idyllic family um in a workshop every, we go in a circle and people talk about things that happen in in the past mm -hmm. and 
some people say these horrendous things that happened and other members of just about every group that I've been in express feeling unentitled, you know, like, I feel guilty that I didn't have all that. My parents loved each other. I was the apple of their eye, you know, they, they feel guilty for having such vulnerability and such a struggle as an adult, when in fact they had the ideal childhood and they hear other people's situations and they think, what's my excuse? And what does it do? Instead of making them feel lucky, they feel guilty. They feel ashamed that they don't, they can't even pin it on something. But of course, all the while they were alive on the planet, whether they had the perfect family or not, they were feeling things on 10 different levels or 20 different levels. And so it's just harder to pinpoint. But we all, it's a universal thing. We're all born. And once we're born, we're all picked up and made to feel we were in a womb. It was perfect. Then we're thrust out, freezing cold, put on a slab, ah, and then we're picked up. Ah, it feels so warm. And then we're put down again on a cool, you know, cot. And then we're picked up again. And then we're hungry. And then we're fed. And then we, so we go from connection, which feels so good, to disconnection, which isn't as comfortable. And then we go connection again and then disconnection. So all of us, even if we had the ideal situation, have been conditioned to feel good when there's connection and not so good when the connection isn't there. Mm -hmm. We're all conditioned that way, even in the ideal circumstance. So anyone can have insecurity and be you know, sensitive to rejection and have what feels like an overreaction when they go through an adult experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not an overreaction. Most people fault themselves for overreacting. It's a natural reaction, but it isn't written about enough. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, what are some of the symptoms or signs that someone has an abandonment mood? If they might not know it, how could they recognize it in some of their internal responses, maybe some of their external reactions, their thought patterns? Well, sometimes it's much more subtle than this, but very often a person has rejection sensitivity, very sensitive to criticism, insecurity in relationships, they get into patterns in relationships, maybe they're only attracted to the unavailable, or they keep going through cycles of abandonment, or maybe they're in a secure relationship, but they feel a lack of passion because they chose someone who would make them so secure that there's there's no challenge and part of them wants the challenge. So there's no passion. It goes on and on, but a, um, the, a stereotypic way that uh, having sort of, you know, abandonment issues, unresolved abandonment affects people is in patterns of self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. Because when we're kids and we're feeling not sure of ourselves socially or with our parents or we don't feel adequate or we feel we're disappointed in ourselves in some way, we develop defense mechanisms. Like a good one is, oh, don't bother, don't even do it. So just don't do. Um, that's a defense mechanism, which is called procrastination mm -hmm. or avoidance. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it works when you're a child. Why put yourself through all that stress when you can just go do something else, avoid it, you know, just not, just don't do that particular thing. Don't join the hockey team or, you know, don't try out for whatever. So when you become an adult and you've, you've had a habit of procrastinating or avoiding situations that could be potentially, you know, good for you and get you, help you move forward, then that's self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. So at, in adulthood, what worked as a kid, avoiding things, procrastinating, now as an adult, it can be self-sabotage. You don't get your papers in, you don't finish your PhD, you know, it goes on and on. It, all the different things. We don't return our library books, you know. There are just so many things that we procrastinate. We, we make all, we do all the unnecessary things, but the one difficult thing, making that phone call to that special person, that we don't do. You know, uh, if we're alone, we, we do everything but, you know, go on a dating site and try to 
find someone because we'd rather avoid that. I mean, there, it, there are so many examples of how procrastination and avoidance is self-sabotage. So is overspending, overeating, over anything, over drinking, over. So there's that is another form of self-sabotage. And the list is very, I have 200 items of self-sabotage on a list on one of my websites. Um, but that's the stereotypic outward manifestation of having abandonment issues when you feel um, that you're not reaching your potential. And it's not because people are holding you back. It's because you're holding yourself back in some way. Mm -hmm. And it's really rooted back to that fear of rejection or that. Yes, it is because it's self abandonment. Let's say I love myself so much that I'm, I love myself enough to postpone gratification and get my dissertation written. That's how much I love myself. As horrible as it is, getting all those statistics, ugh, ugh, having to do all that crap, I, that's how much I love myself, enough to get that done. A lot of people don't let, love themselves quite enough to do the hard stuff that it takes to actually make a big change in life, they only love themselves enough to self to self indulge. Mm. So I love myself, but I love myself only enough to buy that pair of shoes I can't afford, mm. or I love myself enough to have a second glass of wine, or you know that the you love yourself, but you don't love yourself enough to take care of your real needs. So you're self abandoning. So the self-abandonment is a direct effect of going through, you know, the accumulative wound again of devaluing yourself mm -hmm. and then therefore not being important enough even to yourself mm -hmm. to take the necessary steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well said. I like that you make that distinction too, because, you know, especially for my generation, self-love is just the most trendy thing ever. And we can really get caught up in this idea that self-love is having a bubble bath or going shopping or getting that thing you like. And as you said, that really can just actually be a bit of a numbing agent or uh, like a bit of a warm, fuzzy blanket to distract us from getting down to the more disciplined activities that would allow us to really thrive. Um, and so yes. that's an important distinction. Uh, uh, we just have been through um, recently through through valentine's day yeah and um it can be rough for people who are who don't have the love that they need to have in their life they're either getting over a relationship then valentine's day is really hard um or they they just haven't been able to find a relationship or they're in a relationship but the love quotient in the relationship isn't what it should be but um so I just wrote an advice thing, 11 steps you can take. And w I would have made it 12 <laughs> because that sounds better, right? 11, 12 is much better. But I didn't want to give the self-indulgent recommendation because I figured they're going to do that anyway just to get through the day. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, so the bubble bath, well, that's not destructive. But the buying something you can't afford or you know, going back to the old lover who's, you're going to give you a bad emotional hangover the next day, <laughs> you know, all the things that you really shouldn't do, you know, agreeing to the booty call when you know it's, it's self-destructive or drinking a whole bottle of wine and then driving home or something like that. Um, but so I didn't include the self-indulgence because it, I just figured that it, we don't even need to put it there. It's understood that we do those things. We're all human and we're not perfect, but we get so much more self-esteem. We feel so much better about ourselves if we do self-nurturing things instead of self-indulgent things. So I hate going to the gym. I hate it. I don't enjoy stretching my muscles, but if I go, I need to, but if I go to the gym and I go ahead and do it, and I put in a good half hour. I know that's not a long time, but it's better than nothing, right? So if I go to the gym and I put in the time, I will walk away. I won't necessarily like that time that I'm there, although it's not really that bad. I will like myself. 
But if I spent that half hour eating a donut or something, I will enjoy the donut, but I won't, that won't make me feel good about myself. When I do something that is good for me, even if I didn't enjoy the activity particularly, it allows me to say, oh, I did that. I can trust myself. I'm doing the right thing. I, I did something good for me. And that can allow us to feel better about ourselves, much more so than self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, awesome. Not that we don't self-indulge. Yeah. I love self-indulging on gluten-free donuts every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolute necessity. No, I mean, the, the thing that is, defeats all this work is perfectionism. Mm. And the idea is that we think we shouldn't go such and such and because we're not perfect yet. So we're not joining the dating site, let's say, because we still haven't lost that 10 pounds or whatever. We, we feel somehow that we postpone something because we're not perfect yet, but as soon as we're perfect, we'll do it. And that perfectionism is a false, it's a sort of like a false god that many people going through abandonment with childhood issues per, pursue perfectionism because they feel that by trying to be perfect and not make mistakes and do it just right, um, that somehow then they'll be worthy of connection. Right. But it doesn't work, it backfires because they're, they're not just being self-constructive and self-nurturing, they're being too rigid about what they expect from themselves and setting themselves up to, to chastise themselves. That defeats self-love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm not ready to be in a relationship because I'm not yeah. ready yet. You know, I have more work to do. And I think a big part of the healing can happen in connection in sort of surrendering, as you say, to uh, letting go of that perfectionism and really just, you know, accepting yourself as you are and being okay with being. Yeah. Safe. I'm very against when I hear it, it. I sort of go against, you know, self-help um, advice. Not that there are many people who agree with me on this self-help people, but um when people say you have to, if you're still feeling anxious and insecure, if you're still a wreck, mm -hmm. if you like somebody, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh yes, the, how are you going to get over the fear mm -hmm. if, you're, if you wait until you don't have that fear anymore? And science backs me up because it has been shown that fear incubates over time. It doesn't dissipate. So if you don't go ahead and kind of challenge the situation and get yourself more used to doing something, even if it, if you just let it sit there, it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. So the monster under the bed grows. So if you've been through a painful breakup and you finally, you're, you're obviously you have to wait a little bit and work some stuff out and, you know, but while you're still kind of raw, because you'll be raw for a long time until you start making new connections. But if you start to go out there and you find you're freaking out and you're very emotional, that doesn't mean you're not ready. It means this is how your emotional system is reacting to the potential of being rejected again. It means, oh, look, I'm having such painful emotions. I'm, I'm, I'm overreacting quote unquote, um, to any nuance of rejection or disappointment, I'm not ready. No, no. I'm overreacting because my I've been through a trauma. And so I have a lot of work to do to take care of myself. And I can best learn how to do that in relationship to other people. Yes. Going out there and using that as practice opportunities as trial runs mm -hmm. as the as a real learning laboratory mm -hmm. because what we do in relationship is we grow through each other mm -hmm. we come up against each other's things and we somehow benefit from working that through mm -hmm. even if it's rocky or we grow through other people who i am and who you are in, in part has something to do with the people that we had to contend with and 
work with and love or break up with or whatever whatever the case may be yeah that's well said there's there's a real magic when we let ourselves be in relationship with others and see them as our teacher and remember that there's something to learn in connection and rather than running from it and thinking that um, we need to be perfect first because as you say we really do grow through each other so let's say uh people are coming up against these issues like you mentioned where you know they're exploring new connections and they're freaking out um you talk a lot about inner child work and sort of having that dialogue can you touch on that a little bit the timing of you bringing that in is perfect because when you're trying a new relationship and you're a little raw and you are having these strong reactions to other people's inconsistency or maybe they're being too engulfing and you feel well, I, get, I need more space or whatever whatever the case may be um you're having um emotional emotionally intense reactions that maybe in the past you laid at the feet of the other person and expected them to help you with mm -hmm. so that if you and i are trying to have a relationship and i'm insecure in the past maybe i tried to get you to make me feel more secure oh please reassure me i need you to be more consistent mm -hmm. but now that i've understood what my what what's going on and i'm i'm using the relationship as a way of strengthening myself i will now realize i'm responsible for the way i'm reacting i'm responsible for my feeling of um insecurity mm -hmm. it's not your responsibility to make me feel secure it's my responsibility and mine alone it would be great if you could help me a little bit you know be a little bit more reassuring but hey you might not be able to so if you can't it becomes all of my responsibility and i and who else is going to take it but me but what do i do with that well the tool of the inner child so then i would develop i would attribute all of those intense in, you know those insecure feelings and self-doubt and all that i would attribute the emotions to the inner child and i would use my imagination to sort of personify that as this very young child having these emotions and imagine that that young child is within me and then i would create a dialogue written writing is the best the most effective way to work on this um a dialogue where the adult self big me you know the the cognitive person the the executive in charge the command central up here in my you know cerebral cortex the adult me then can have a dialogue with this inner child and I then become the adult to try to make that inner child feel better, feel more secure, resolve some of the self-doubt, provide the reassurance, and then you and I, well, I can leave you out of the loop. Maybe a little bit I'll look to you for reassurance, but mostly I can now enjoy you for what you're offering and go and take care of myself so the when you start to use the tool of the inner child work that that i talk about in all four of my books um, when you start to use that tool you are now taking responsibility and creating a direct a completed loop around you and your feelings rather than need your lover your boss your your best friend your you know rather than need the external validation and would you say that that also ties into helping us choose healthier connections because when we are choosing to self-nurture and you know reparent essentially our inner child we're no longer expecting other people to be responsible for feeling good or safe or secure and so in some ways would that help us choose relationships that are aligned and perhaps say no to relationships that we know aren't serving us? Well, one thing um, that people ask me all the time is, let's say they have a pattern of choosing unavailable people and conversely, when, they, when somebody is available, they lose interest and they don't want that anymore. They wanna stay interested even if the other person is pursuing them as much as they're pursuing them. They don't wanna shut down and lose interest just because the other person is available 
and they they want to choose available people and stay attracted to them. I, I get this all the time. Every day I get emails, I get phone calls every day within my workshops. I've written about this in all my books and many of my blogs and articles. Um, and they want to know if I do this work, will I become attracted to people who are available? <laughs> and the answer is it a shift can happen. But it isn't, you can't, well, this is my goal. I'm going to do the exercise and now it's going to change because then you find yourself very attracted to someone who seems available, but then you find out they seemed available, but they actually lost interest when you became interested in them. So the shift is a subtle shift and it does occur. So your question of do you choose differently? Do you choose people who will be more reciprocal? The answer is yes, mm -hmm. but it's not a magic bullet answer. Mm -hmm. It does happen. You have to keep at this work. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of build it into your lifestyle and do it on an ongoing basis. And yes, then you will. Let's say um, so many people have this problem of they get into non-symmetrical positions to people. So they they form a friend at work and they start to really show that friend real kindness and helpfulness and when the friend's birthday comes up they they give them a card and a gift and take them out to lunch or whatever then it's their birthday and they say well, my birthday's next week but they don't get the card they don't get the gift and they don't get lunch. It's an asymmetrical connection. They've managed to be sort of, they've given something, but they're not receiving in return. This is a common phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And it's very common for people who had childhood histories like an alcoholic parent to get into asymmetrical relationships. So, you do the work and you start to love yourself more and then loving yourself is not just lip service it means doing things for yourself so instead of going out of your way to remember somebody else's birthday you might be doing something positive for yourself like maybe making a phone call that's difficult or who knows something that you needed to do but as you put yourself into a more important position within your own life you do start to choose differently. You do start to be a little bit more selfful around other people. So the ones who want to just sort of use you for your admiration, they, you know, they, they're no longer able to really. So your relationships start to become more reciprocal. I like that. There used to be a time where I was word for word in those asymmetrical relationships, especially in my earlier years. And um, in my mid twenties, I started doing this practice whenever I was about to give, whether it was purchase somebody a gift or just extend my energy in any way. And I would just take a moment to tune in and ask, what part of me wants this? The part of me that wants validation and love or the part of me that's just feeling generous and abundant? And if it was coming from a place of needing love or validation, then I would just stop and I would either buy myself a gift or I would make myself a tea or I would you know, do something that was directed towards myself. And if I could confirm, no, this is just coming from abundance and I don't need anything back, then I would extend it. And that really kind of helped me rewire that pattern. of. Oh, that would help it completely. That's wonderful because you're in that instance, you're describing how you give to give and not to get, but it requires being very honest with yourself because when you stand back and ask that question, hmm, I want to make Jeanette feel terrific about her birthday and make a fuss, but do I have an expectation that she'll appreciate me or that somehow when it's my turn, she'll do the same or Am I do I need something from her? What are my expectations? Or is it just coming from just generosity? Where is it coming from? The amount of integrity that you need to be able to honestly answer that question can be the, the problem. And a lot of people have so much 
self-delusion and self-deceit blocking them from even making that determination mm -hmm. that the tools of trying to zero in on what you're feeling and really know yourself better are, take a long time mm -hmm. but they do eventually pay off there too mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I love that. So let's say we're going to give people just a few ways to start doing that tuning in, um, getting more in touch with their feelings so that they can become a little bit more self-aware. What are some of the things that you guide your clients through? Well, the, I'm, I'm into shortcuts because of course the field of psychotherapy has psychoanalysis and other forms of therapy to get in touch with your feelings. But look how long it takes. Think of Woody <laughs> Allen on a couch for five days a week for years, 20 years. I don't know. I'm, I forget his, the exact statistics, but he makes jokes about it. But um, it's very time consuming and very expensive and unrealistic to, to get in touch with your feelings by um, many of the methods that we think of as psychotherapy. But yet that is the goal of psychotherapy to make what's unconscious conscious, to bring the unconscious up to consciousness. Um, so I look for shortcuts mm -hmm. and the shortest cut mm -hmm. I know of is the inner child dialogue. I don't know of any other one personifying an inner child who feels abandoned and sh ashamed and fearful of being, of losing the connection and has all these very tender emotions and excitements and wants and desires and dreams and disappointments and self-doubts. That's the inner child imagining, using your imagination to create um, that child and then having big you try to draw, draw that child out. That is the shortest cut that I know of to zero in on what's, what's going on inside. I'll tell you, even I can be surprised at what's going on inside when I do my dialogue. Mm -hmm. I could avoid it and, uh, you know, sort of ignore it for a, a while. And then I suddenly find myself having an emotion I'm not sure of. And I think, oh, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And I, much to my surprise, I'm having some incredibly, you know, tender little feeling in there. But it, it doesn't, I can't just sort of imagine it. I have to do the dialogue to, to get to it. And it's a shortcut. Mm -hmm. So that is important. Then when you can get in touch with those feelings and you do the dialogue, you're actually doing two things. You're administering to yourself so that you're not looking to other people, which is where you lose your power by always needing other people to love you and do this for you and that for you so that you could feel more comfortable. Um, but not only it is that a way of, of um, sort of taking other people out of the loop, but it's also a motivating factor in taking positive actions. Mm -hmm. So you have all these little feelings and you get in touch with them through the dialogue. But what does little you really want? What, it, what could you do to make little you a little happier? If you woke up tomorrow and decided to do something for yourself that would make little you feel happier, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Self-indulgence won't do it. Really, that's the outer child, which we didn't get to, but we'll see. Um, it'll be something that you need to do. So it might be something simple like um, little you wants more love so big you says okay tomorrow here's what we're going to do I'm just going to give you a little tiny bit of love we're going to, and then you can get into a generous frame and decide to give love or call an old friend or something of that sort and exchange something meaningful but to take an action so it it is an action-oriented process, dealing with your feelings, getting in touch with them, and then administering them to them through actions. You don't think your way out of abandonment. You do your way out. It is an active program. So you take these little baby steps that are tiny little things. because You don't want to bite off more than you can chew. 
but you want to do something that you can do within it with easily something make a phone call uh, take a walk or something of that sort a tiny baby step but it's in order to administer to the feelings of little you love it just to note for people watching i did uh i wrote a little recap of inner child work and referenced your book and put some screenshots of your book with links oh, good. Um, on risingwoman.com which i'll link to in this interview but i also wanted to ask you where you would suggest they go to find the full dialogue process is it in the journey from abandonment to healing you would suggest um, well you know there are i i wrote four books about it so journey from abandonment yes it does discuss that the abandonment recovery workbook kind of tries to make it easier okay. you know it has it sort of step by step but then you have outer child the taming your outer child which is helping you deal with your self-sabotage which is a way of giving yourself love so the outer child the the biggest tool for overcoming self-sabotage is the dialogue with your inner child because when you have a tight coalition big you to little you outer child the part that acts out and breaks your diet and gets attracted to the wrong people and overspend your credit card and stuff like that that's your outer child that part doesn't have a chance to act out because your inner child and your adult are in this beautiful love love you know relationship and can't really get much power so that so so far i've mentioned three books then you have black swan the lessons of abandonment recovery and that's all about a little girl it helps you to personify your inner child it's mm. all about the inner child beautiful i haven't read that one yet i'll check it out oh well that's great yeah so i'm going to link to all of these books and the blog posts where i've recapped some of your work um, for people who want to go deeper because um, i've always loved the way you distinguish between the inner child the outer child and and you know the big you because i think sometimes we think that there's just the inner child and then the uh, the adult and that the inner child is what's acting out and so then people think uh, that they need to sort of suppress the inner child but it's sort of the opposite you put your finger exactly on it right? because if, if if you don't have another child which is the outer child that you can blame the bad stuff on when you go to say to your inner child i love you you're so then you're really saying i love you but actually you're such a maniac <laughs> i love you but you're a pain in my neck you're always doing the wrong thing you need to take all the bad stuff and blame it on out or outside of the self so it won't damage you so that you can have a relationship with the innocent blameless emotional part mm -hmm. the outer child even though it does self-sabotaging things eventually becomes the buddy mm -hmm. you know you eventually love your outer child also mm -hmm. i mean you love it at the beginning too because it's part of you but it is outside of the self and you can sort of ah, that outer child um but eventually you learn to um to come to terms with your outer child mm -hmm. and outer child is i sort of visualize a well-intentioned but poorly trained guard dog perfect Mm -hmm. Yes, and just as sort of primitive as a guard dog. Yeah. Can't distinguish everything, makes mistakes and overdoes it and jumps on people, you know, mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is it. That's that's the work is really coming into harmony with our inner child and learning how to make adult decisions while not self-rejecting, um, building a new relationship to what it really means to be self-loving. Um, yes. Yeah. Really really wonderful okay so if people want to find your work where can they go well um i have two websites um abandonment.net and outerchild.net they're both nets that capture anyone going through abandonment or who's ever had a disconnection and all the people who struggle with self-sabotage so those are two different websites and on both websites i there's a contact button and they can reach me and the books are listed and it's pretty easy. And do you do consulting or private sessions or do you mainly work in workshop? Uh, I do um, workshops and those are life changing. I, I would highly recommend attending a workshop. 
they're just really very life-changing. Um, and I, of course, I do uh, consultations, private consultations on a limited basis. Okay, where do you hold your workshops? Or is it worldwide or do you work well, in- Well, it is worldwide, um, but um, mostly on the East Coast and the West Coast. Okay, wonderful. Uh, is there anything that you felt like we missed or something that you wanted to add before we wrap this interview up? Um, there's, I think that it, this was, thank you for your questions, very comprehensive in the way that you covered it. Um, just that you don't have to change something in your life a lot to make a huge difference. You can change just a little bit. For instance, if you're too, let's say, self-codependent, oh, Mm -hmm. You don't have to go from being codependent to being non code or a people pleaser. You don't have to go from being a people pleaser to a not people pleaser. You could just maybe be a little bit less of a people pleaser. And that little change, you don't have to be perfect, yeah. can make all the difference in the world. And so my message is always, we're looking to bump it up. We're looking to make the smallest improvement. That improvement can completely change our lives because we don't have to be perfect to get this to get a good life i love that it's such a good reminder that's one of the core consistent teachings that we operate from as well and we can all use that reminder so thank you um, thank you so much for your time today this was wonderful you're one of my personal heroes so i really appreciate your work and everything thank you for thank you for all of your questions and your interest mm -hmm. So I'll include links to all of Susan's books and workshops and everything that you can uh, read about on Rising Woman uh, in the uh, section below. And uh, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Mm -hmm.